Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's really exciting to be back at NASIS. Um, today, um, one second. Um, as Mamatha mentioned, I'm Megan, um, and I am presenting on behalf of myself and Amber Boss from the University of Kentucky. And today we're going to be sharing our practical thoughts on maps and positionality. And like any good work in progress, we have many working names for this project. And our current, uh, our current land is Pressing Pause, a call for reflection and action. And so as some of you might know, uh, much of my work is really centered on uh, feminist mapping and what that means for cartographers, mappers, designers. And Amber's work focuses on inclusive participatory cartography in relationship to empowerment and uh, computing, community engagement. Um, and last spring, we were at a critical GIS workshop, and we were invited to respond to this prompt. What should critical GIS look like? And as we approached this question, of course, through a feminist lens, it was quickly apparent that to answer this question, we had to rethink it, reframe it, and rewrite it. So we made a few edits into a what can feminist mapping or GIS be? And this change, while it might seem really subtle and perhaps insignificant, it does in fact have its own politics of its own. We're not diving into that today, but we'd love to talk to you after the talk. Um, but our task was really trying to figure out how do we distill feminist mapping into a practical toolkit um, that, is seamlessly blends, that seamlessly blends feminist theory with our practice? Uh, we wanted to create an accessible entry point um, and provide some examples that we can build into our workflows, our collaborations, and into our designs. And so before we get to that, we're going to do a quick crash course in feminist mapping, which I've been studying for like five years now. Um, and so I'm going to define a couple, uh, couple key phrases that I'll be using. Um, and for many, of you, for many of you, these words are going to be familiar. It might be a review, but I think that's still important. And for some, it might be really abstract or perhaps unfamiliar. But the uh, important goal is to recognize that the terms we're using aren't new. Amber and I didn't invent feminism. This is a much larger history than the two of us. But it's the way that we think about feminist theory in relationship to the work that we all do. And so um, I think of feminist mapping as bigger than cartography. It's really a transdisciplinary field. It can be thought of as a social movement that brings cartography into conversation with related fields like feminist digital geographies, queer GIS, indigenous cartographies, data feminism, design justice, critical code studies, all of which are really grappling with this question of really pushing theory and practice forward through these interesting lenses. And so drawing on the work of Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein, I happen to be their biggest fangirl, uh, we can think of feminist mapping as the often visual practice. It doesn't have to be visual, it can be tactile, it can be tangible. Um, in the expression of spatial information um, that addresses questions of power, inequality, representation, and ethics. And so these last four words are really kind of the core behind feminist mapping and the principles we want to be bringing into it. And so with that, we turn to reflexivity. And so we are trying to think of, you know, what is that entry point? What is that key word we can all be thinking about? And we came to reflexivity. And this can be, um, there are varying words that can be associated with this. Uh, but really, we're thinking of reflexivity as this effort to make the invisible visible. How do we map the unseen and kind of these processes and these messy things that happen behind the scenes? We can think of this as the factors and the influences that impact our work, our research, our map making. And we can also um, kind of locate ourselves in larger projects, or, or locate ourselves in projects into kind of broader contexts around power and representation in the fields and um, systematic structures around us. And so all of this basically kind of stems from this idea that all knowledge, and this is from Donna Haraway, but all knowledge is situated in some context. Um, and it's important to recognize that knowledge and maps all come from somewhere. A lot of us tend to make them. Um, but it rejects the idea that there's kind of this pure, universalizing, top-down, one-shot way to do mapping. Um, and it's also important to think about this as it's not only the politics, but also the power of our position in this field um, and in our, in our workplaces and in our everyday lives. And so it's also really interesting to think what reflexivity is not. And so some people think it's just you know, a list about myself or ourselves. Um, but our identities are definitely important here. But what's, impo what's crucial in feminist reflexivity is that we're thinking about ourselves in relationship to power and privilege. So how does my identity as a white woman in academics who shows up at NASA's every year, how does that impact uh, collaborations or um, different types of work that I do? 
Um, reflexivity also requires us to not only recognize these things, but also to do something about them. And so, um, you know, if we want to talk about systemic racism, how can I use my position to either step back or step in when I need to? Um, reflexivity isn't a shield, it's not a defense mechanism. I think some people kind of use it as, you know, I, this, this is what I said I am, I'm not gonna, uh, I can't take any critique. But it's really important to think of reflexivity as just kind of this inward facing reflection on uh, how we exist in the mapping community. Um, it's, not in, uh, it's not limited to individuals. We can think of reflexivity with NASIS and we can think about the mechanisms that we want to promote as an organization. Um, and we can think about how we're you know, situated within uh, broader communities. And lastly, reflexivity is really truly like an ongoing continuous process that uh, in my mind, uh, being comfortable with our reflexivity essentially is complacency. So we gotta continually be grappling with these types of ideas. So what does that mean for mapping? What are the stakes? And so in Amber and I's work, we're kind of looking at the back of the embroidery. We're looking at the back of the map, the, the, the things that are going on and influencing the maps that we make. And we argue that in the absence of intentional reflexivity, we run the risk of continuing to reinforce normative constructs in society and neglect issues of power, representation, equity, and inclusion. And while feminist scholars and cartographers, like this isn't new again, cartographers are doing this, um, reflexivity is often too, too often invisible in some of our mapping processes and products. And so this is kind of our call to bring some of this stuff to the forefront. Um, so, as cartographers, mappers, and designers, what can we do? And we've been thinking about um, kind of brainstorming ideas and inspiration pieces that we can bring to the table and say, okay, let's all press pause. Let's all think of, is there one instance in our workflow where we can incorporate something that's written, something that's visual, something that's uh, collective or audio oriented? Um, and so beginning with written practice, uh, I think reflexivity tends to be in, uh, or at least, the way I came to it was through written practice. And so one way to tangibly think about this is in artist statements. And so uh, Torquay's Dyson tells the history of black liberation through cartographic art, simultaneously situating herself in the goals of the project um, and kind of grappling with uh, uh, you know, what was the intent and purpose and what does she bring to the table in the, her work. What's interesting, cartographers don't tend to um, have artist statements with all of our maps. It would be wonderful if we did. And so essentially I'm thinking of what would it mean to have a cartographer statement with the maps that we put out there? You know, oftentimes we release the data or release our workflow, but what if we actually look at kind of our power and privilege in a really kind of public format too, similar to an artist statement? Um, in academics, we also tend to have students fill, you know, write a reflection with your assignment, but the professors tend to, uh, it's pretty rare for us to do the same. So I think there's a really strong urge to have cartographer statements with some of the stuff that we're producing, or at least like a, you know, appendix or something like that. Um, in our writing, it's also important to be aware of who we cite, who we invite to things, and perhaps who we follow on Twitter. Citation practices in academics, panels at conferences, and all-star cartographers that we all follow on Twitter all influence the way that we approach mapping. Um, and a reflexive approach to these types of writing are crucial in our discussions of power and privilege in cartography. And so um, I think these are things that we can be thinking of as, uh, as we work through um, our, you know, our day-to-day -day map life. Um, it was really exciting. I wasn't in this session, but uh, Katie Kowalski started a GitHub page that's all about um, basically getting a, a diverse group of cartographers in a running list. So if you're ever looking for cartographers to participate in different panels and workshops and whatever else, this is now live. I don't have the, the link, we'll put it on Twitter, but uh, it's really exciting to see people really thinking about, okay, how can we expand who we follow on Twitter? How can we expand who we include in these different spaces? Um, so it's a, a good step in the right direction. Uh, we can also, uh, reflexivity can show up in some different avenues, like our syllabi, uh, and in some cases our CVs. Um, and so on the, on the left side, um, Rob Roth, who's my advisor, included a reflexivity statement in his syllabus, and I thought that was a really powerful move of kind of, I mean, you're not gonna level the playing field by any means, but it really kind of opens up conversation of how are we gonna interact and exist as a class. Um, the example on the right is kind of funny, it's a CV of failures, which I think we all have those. Um, but making those types of things transparent, and so it's you know maybe less reflexive and more kind of a fun pun. But thinking about, uh, we usually present our best self on our CVs. 
Um, we can also think of audio, um, in which it might seem a little different for a visual field, but audio recording can be a really reflexive and helpful practice. And so um, why audio? Um, audio is advantageous for a variety of reasons. Translating our reflexivity into writing tends to be a little more performative, and if anyone, um, um, yeah, I tend to you know, edit and rewrite my own language. But by recording, really we're pressing pause and we tend to be unfiltered, uh, you know, maybe kind of the rough cut of you know, our processes and our, like our, our frame of thinking. Uh, it's perhaps a bit more vulnerable than writing, um, but it's also super valuable. So I encourage you to kind of dabble with what that might look like in your daily practice. Um, it can also take less time. I found, uh, yeah, it's a lot easier to just record yourself for five minutes than write for an hour. Um, and this can take place with individuals as well as teams. And so social scientists and researchers have used audio practices in a couple of different ways. Uh, I'll briefly just mention them. Uh, oral positionality is really that inward facing uh, approach to thinking about, um, thinking about our own reflexivity. And then voice notes tend to be more descriptive and more kind of, document, uh, kind of the documenting the process that you went through. So these are just two different ways that you could use this. I've used this um, recording after I run workshops to kind of debrief with my collaborators. I've also used it um, briefly in some of my own mapping projects to say, okay, like this is what I did, let me like think through it a little bit. Um, but audio could be really important. And as cartographers, I would bet most of us tend to use visual uh, visualizations in our work. Uh, but reflexivity can also be a, a visual practice. And so I, ar or we argue in our paper that, uh, you know, thinking about the different ways that we document process and to visually practice reflexivity, we kind of have to shift our focus from the end product, say on the right, to something that's like uh, something on the left that really exposes, okay, we remove these labels, these are the labels that I spelled wrong, and uh, kind of the generalization techniques that went into that. Um, and so reflexivity is really important to our decision making and kind of being transparent about that process is crucial. And this can take a variety of formats. Um, I don't know about you, but I tend to have 30 some drafts of every single map that I make. Uh, but even just, I downloaded this for fun to kind of see, okay, like where do the big shifts happen and where do the small shifts happen? And I'm almost more interested in the small shifts because what was I thinking, you know, shifting all these small labels back and forth. But I think it's really interesting to just kind of not only, you know, post on Twitter our, you know, amazing outputs, but also the kind of these nitty gritty processes along the way. And we do think the power is really in combining something like this, this versioning and documenting with maybe writing or audio recording so we can actually better understand what's happening in these small shifts and not, you know, kind of being like, oh, I wonder if they saw that label move. Uh, but to really think about how we can use kind of this multimodal way of thinking and being reflexive and bringing that into our work. And this can happen at multiple scales. The left was just me pulling, uh, they're not screenshots, but they're uh, the map examples that I was working with. And it can also scale up to something like Travis White and Aaron Tavares's uh, curating terrain exhibit where they printed out every single layer within their terrain map. And it was really interesting because you can see the big shifts, you can see the DM, you can see the, the hill shade, but then you see like the really faint highlighting in yellow and that's printed on its own page. And so kind of uh, demystifying the map and the manipulation that went into that is, I mean, this is like, took them probably a year to put together, uh, but is one possibility for reflexive visual practice. I've also turned to kind of a visual journal as a way to think through my own reflexivity. Um, a lot of my work, and I presented on this last year, is with icon design. And someone asked me, well, do you redraw icons? Um, so essentially my workshops, people redesign icons over and over and over and over again. And I was like, no, but I probably should start doing that myself. And so I've started to kind of take an icon at a time and spend half hour, an hour just redrawing that, documenting, kind of adding my questions and seeing what kind of bias popped up with that. We can also position ourselves in our maps, and so this is an example from Margaret Pierce, and essentially um, kind of position ourselves in our map, and in this example, uh, the map is of a French fur trader's journey, and the red, indicate, er, the red demonstrates the individual's uh, own narrative carrying himself through the map. And so we can think about the ways that we can play with reflexivity in the actual graphic symbols on our map. How do we demonstrate the power that we have? How do we actually visualize that? How do we ingrain that into the cartographic language that we're using? So I think there's a lot of potential here and it's kind of a challenge for all of us to think about how can we be more present and more reflexive in our designs? 
Last, the question is when to press pause. Um, I think we can think of uh, different types of workflows. This one just happens to be from NPR graphics. At what point from you know, conceptualization of a project to the development to the uh, uh, development to edits and redesigns, at what point do you press pause? And I think you know, we can bake that in throughout all of these processes. We were talking about user centers as design before, which I think is great. We tend to, you know, we want to make sure the people that are using our maps um, you know, are able to use them in the ways that they're intended, but we also need to think about our reflexivity as we're placed within these diagrams too. And so, you know, how often does your team stop, team stop, thank you, um, team stop to, you know, ask those important questions or to every kind of brainstorm or, you know, think independently and come back to the group, but really how can we do that together? And so we argue that we need to press pause throughout the entire design squiggle from data collection to the final design uh, and really kind of be transparent about that. And what we really truly believe is that uh, this is critical. Uh, we know that maps are powerful and we know that maps are integral to addressing the critical challenges of our time. And so the complex issues aren't gonna go away. And so we think that, uh, uh, sorry, that uh, cartography today demands reflexivity. We need to be thinking about these things, which is why we're like, yes, practical cartography day, that's kind of our in. I think the other thing that we need to be thinking about is uh, reflexivity is also really critical to understanding how we exist as a mapping community. Energy is building in this area um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion in and outside of cartography. Last year, we had some incredible sessions that really kind of elevated that conversation, which were, were really great. But I think we need more attention in this area so we can kind of think through what reflexivity looks like as a collective. And then last, um, yeah, I think that was it. <laughs> uh, in terms of collective, Amber and I have been thinking, okay, well, how do we actually make this easier? What are the first steps? And so one of the things that we've been doing, um, and we have cards and pens and papers that if you have questions that you ask yourself, Amber's right in the second row, uh, what kinds of questions do you ask yourself or and when do you ask those? And so if you have any tips and tricks that you wanna add into this conversation, we would love it. Um, and we also have a uh, Google sheet link if you wanna kinda actively jump into it. And so thank you, I appreciate it, and uh, happy to take questions. <laughs>